Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Coffee Break, the show where we break down interesting topics, all within the time it takes you to enjoy a few cups of coffee. Today, I'll be your host. My name is Clifford Swartz, uh, engineer at Microchip Technology, and today we're going to be talking about Chip Scale Atomic Clocks, or CSAC. I won't be doing this talk alone, though. Through the power of the internet, I have a very special guest. Stuart, how are you? Good morning, Clifford. How are you? I'm good. I'm excited. So Stuart is joining us uh, all the way from Massachusetts, I think, right? Nice, I got it right. And uh, like I said, we're going to be talking about CSACs, but before we dive into that topic, I'm going to throw it over to Michael Pierce in the booth and can tell all of you wonderful people how to participate. How are you doing, Michael? Doing good, thanks. So, yep, we're live on Facebook, YouTube, and LinkedIn. Uh, please submit your questions in the chat, and we will attempt to answer them at the end of the, uh, the break. And um, there may be some experts online that might actually answer your questions as well. Uh, also, please like and share this this uh, this video, um, this live stream. Uh, we'd love to get to as many people as possible. Um, we're all around the world, even this morning. I see people from Venezuela, Taiwan, and, and other places. So please keep sharing. We love getting extra people. Um, also, if we can't get to your question at the end, uh, please email us at livestream at microchip.com, and we'll make sure it gets through to the right people. So back to you, Clifford. Cool. Thank you very much. Uh, so, Stuart, before we can talk about chip scale atomic clocks, do you mind giving us a background about what an atomic clock is? Sure, Clipper. So, um, atomic clocks take advantage of an intrinsic physical property. Some atoms uh, resonate or change energy state at very specific frequencies if they're energized by photons. But that activation of that changed energy state only happens if you're exactly at the right frequency. And there you can see three uh, typical... Um, applications of an atomic clock and their different resonant frequencies. Um, there you see a blue physics package. That essentially contains the atoms, and it's, it's a package. It's a literal package, and the microwave synthesizer is used to make that energy transition happen. And um, based on the accuracy of the microwave synthesizer, there's an error signal, and that uses a control loop to drive a local oscillator. And based on the strength of the error signal, then the microwave uh, synthesizer is adjusted such that the local oscillator ends up being exactly in tune with the physics package. And that is kept on frequency, and that's called a self-adjusting uh, feedback loop. And so how many different types of CSACs, or atomic clocks rather, are there? Uh, there's several different types of atomic clocks. The most common types of atoms that are used in atomic clocks are cesium, um, hydrogen, and rubidium. Cesium beam tubes uh, re uh, resonate at that 9 gigahertz level, rubidium and hydrogen. If you notice that, that they're all at the gigahertz uh, level. And um, what's so powerful about this technique is that the atoms don't change. So the physical property doesn't change over time. Cesium is used ubiquitously in things like telecom, um, government and defense. It's typically a 3U rack mounted system and it's used all over the world. Hydrogen is usually a larger atomic clock. It can be the size of a small fridge. It's used for hard science and for metrology. Rubidium is the workhorse of <laughs> atomic clocks. It gets used in things like um, cellular base stations and test sets. And um, so very ubiquitous um, in the market. So of those three, it sounds like cesium is the best for smaller applications. And so does that mean that it's more often found in uh, CSACs or no? Yeah, I've got a picture of a CSAC there. That's an atomic clock that uses uh, uh, the cesium atom as its, as its baseline. And uh, so that's not a rack mounted unit. That's a very special atomic clock. Cool. And sort of springboarding off of that, do you mind talking a little bit about what makes CSAC so special? Oh, sure. So um, um, CSAC is able to take all of the atomic uh, physics and engineering I talked about and really shrink it down uh, to a very small package using uh, sophisticated, uh, sophisticated manufacturing techniques 
down to a 16 cubic centimeter size oscillator. I've actually got one here, Clifford. Let me show you real quick. If you look at the layout of a CSAC, you see how small it is. Yeah. It's got a physics package, which is the heart of the atomic clock. This is where the cesium is. You've got a microcontroller. This is the brains of the atomic clock. And you've got a microwave uh, system here. This is the one that energizes and makes that energy state change happen. And then you've got a TCX. So this is the voice of the CSAC. This is the output usable frequency. And this is locked to the atomic resonance here, which gives you that very, very high accuracy. So um, as I said, the CSAC is at, at the heart of the CSAC is a physics package. You see a picture there with tweezers around it. That contains a very small amount of cesium inside a vacuum packaged MEMS designed ceramic package inside again a metal box made of mu metal to isolate it from uh, magnetic fields. So the physics package is completely isolated from the outside world and that makes it very stable and very um, resilient to any kind of environmental effects. Um, it's not brand new technology. Uh, this was co-founded over 10 years, uh, co-funded over 10 years ago by DARPA and but we were able to successfully commercialize it uh, 10 years ago and uh, the real claim to fame of this design is its low power that 120 milliwatt power clifford is one tenth of what you would expect to have to use on a typical oven controlled crystal oscillator and that's what people want they want the ultra low power as well as the atomic accuracy uh, it's also got the one pulse per second steering which allows you to discipline this oscillator from something like a GPS uh, receiver. And um, it's also, because it's got a great MEMS design, it's very rugged and it's very um, resilient to vibration and shock, uh, making this a very versatile product. And um, it's not simple to make. It's, it's not a trivial exercise to put a CSAC together. Right. But we've had 10 years to work on the the process and through continual improvement, we've now scaled up and we ship many thousands of years uh, of these every year. So the technology is pretty cool and all the stats that you just talked about are kind of revolutionary if you think about them. What sort of applications and industries do we see CSACs being used in today? Yeah, so um, the first application that was, that was envisioned for CSAC was assured position navigation and timing. So. Initially, when DARPA was involved, the vision was to have a super low powered atomic oscillator that could be used in military systems when GPS was unavailable, denied, spoofed, or jammed. And so you'll see now, if you look up the acronym assured PNT, that's, that's a very well-known term. Uh, and you'll often see the CSAC associated as a high performance oscillator to give you that local time on a vehicle or on a soldier's backpack or on a plane or on a drone, when you need to have that local clock in order to navigate and complete the mission. Another uh, defense application is VSAT, which is very small aperture receiver. And that what that lets you do is to have a field deployed man portable broadband encrypted communications, again, without GPS in hostile environments and be able to turn on that system and do secure encrypted communications with a very accurate oscillator. In this case, it gets multiplied up to gigahertz in order to make that communications happen. So very important that it, that it is small, portable, and low power because it's all battery. Another defense one is a uh, AUV and um, autonomous underwater vehicle. Just imagine a um, um, deployment underwater for weeks of a small sub unmanned. It's collecting data, it's navigating. It's doing intelligence gathering all on batteries, but it needs a clock with it that doesn't have GPS access. And the, and the CSAC gives them that local atomic clock that they need. Uh, on the right, we have something which I think is really interesting, which is ocean bottom seismic. This is where you can actually do oil and gas exploration uh, with less exploratory, exploratory drilling. What you do is you do, um, uh, you put a bunch of um, sensors, up to thousands of sensors, each of them with a CSAC on the ocean bottom floor, and you put a shock wave into the bedrock and you wait for the signal to come back. The CSAC helps you precisely put a timestamp on all that data, which helps you create a 3D model of the oil and gas reserves without having to do a bunch of exploratory drilling. Uh, and, and I think that's really important. And then recently in space, CSAC has been 
used for really fascinating applications by NASA to do optical time transfer between CubeSats instead of having to rely on a ground station. And that's really laying the path for doing navigation beyond the moon to, to Mars and, and, and to other planets. And then one other one, which is key, which is remote sensing. So this is basically the satellites in space staring at human activity, taking pictures, reading RF signals. All that data needs to be timestamped so you can create a very complete picture of what's happening in terms of climate change and other type of human activity. And uh, so exciting stuff in terms of applications. Absolutely. And so just everything that you were talking about, there's tremendous variation between all those different industries and applications. What makes CSAC technology such a perfect fit? Yeah, right. So the CSAC is on the ocean bottom. It's on the battlefield uh, and it's in space. Uh, but all those applications kind of have a few things in common that, that we have to bear in mind. So they all need that real super precision of atomic accuracy in order for that application to work. It gives you the granularity, gives you the information, it gives you the ability to complete uh, the task, complete the mission. They all work on batteries. They're all highly portable. Imagine putting a payload in space uh, weight is key. And you and you and if you have a system that needs a big battery, that's just not going to work. Right. Um, and then the warm-up time is huge too. So if you think about that VSAT application where you need to get your system up and running in two minutes and be effective in your application. Uh, many crystal oscillators, which are the alternative, can, can take many hours to get on frequency. So they just don't work in that scenario. And uh, another great example is that time drift over a day. So two microseconds per day uh, is, is what lots of these applications need uh, to visualize that. Uh, this is a back of, back of the envelope calculation. Um, that's equivalent to if you're going to take a tape measure and measure between uh, Tokyo and London wow. uh, to get get the measurement within uh, two tenths of a millimeter right. right. So that's what the CSAC gives you if you were trying to do a, a you know measure a distance with uh, equivalent accuracy. And then of course the convenience and one one big thing is many of those apps go from hot to cold to hot. And the oscillator has to stay on frequency during those temperature changes. And an atomic clock in the shape of a CSAC gives you that control to minimize the frequency change over those wide temperature swings. And there's a few others there that we may not have time to get into. But the bottom line is uh, you, can, you can board mount this and you've got the rugged packaging, which makes it very versatile. It doesn't have to be plugged into a wall. It doesn't need, uh, have to be on a desktop. It's designed to do interesting and exciting things in different and exciting places. It absolutely is pretty exciting. So, Stuart, how do you recommend engineers get started designing with CSAC? Sure. Uh, well, we wanted to make it as easy as possible. Uh, I know the technology sounds, uh, you know, interesting and challenging, but it is. It is a CSAC. It is a modular device. And we have made available what we call a, a developer's kit. You see a picture there of a PCBA that we designed that you can put on your desktop, you plug it into the wall. It's got all the inputs and outputs are right there that you need to, to give the commands to the CSAC and get the telemetry off it and then to test your design. Uh, we also have some software that you can put on your PC and you can uh, do some uh, interaction and, and it's got a nice GUI on it and it's, and it's freely downloadable. And there's also a very good user guide that teaches you everything that you wanted to know about getting started with CSAC. Cool. And um, so it's a good kit. And so if people want to learn more right now, they could go on the web and it looks like we can send them to microchip.com forward slash uh, CSAC. Yeah, that's the place to go to check it out for sure. Cool. Well, thank you very much, Stuart. I believe that brings us to the end of the uh, presentation portion. Is there anything else you want to add? No, I'm just happy to be here. Thanks for having me on. And um, Again, this is a great program, so let's see if we have any great questions. Yeah. Pierce, what do we got? So they're actually starting to roll in. Uh, so we have the first one from Zachary. Um, how does a CSAC compare to a crystal oscillator? Okay, Zachary, thank you for that question. Great question. So essentially, a CSAC is, is, is a high-performance oscillator uh, with an atomic heartbeat, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, it's typically um, has 
a higher performance uh, in terms of being able to drift less over a day. Remember that comparison of two microseconds per day of drift. Uh, a typical crystal oscillator will drift a lot more. Now they're less expensive, but they but they have much less performance. So there is that trade-off of, of performance versus cost. And then uh, also a, um, a, a crystal oscillator will use a lot more power, uh, up to 10 times more power. So if you have a really budget uh, tight budget on power, or if you're battery powered, then then you very much want to look at an atomic uh, clock like a CSAC versus an oven controlled crystal oscillator. Yeah, and we have one from uh, Roberto Iglesias. Uh, can a set of, say, three or more CSACs be synchronized to a master unit, uh, for example, for a network connected service? Yeah, we have all kinds of. Um, uh, users out there that have been doing different experiments about uh, putting CSACs together, disciplining them, uh, and you know maximizing their performance. There's, there's lots of information online actually that I've been able to find as well about papers and things like that. So yeah, they can be disciplined, and they can also be networked together, and you can you can synchronize them very precisely. And many of our customers actually do synchronize them. For example, the ocean bottom seismic application where they're all exactly synchronized so that when they take the information, uh, the, the image, the graphic image that they get can be put back together after the fact and they can get that image only because uh, the clocks were all synchronized. Okay, and we have one from uh, Raju Kavita. Uh, which parameter can, can we control through software on the test board. So what parameters can you control using that software? Yeah, so you can you can configure your disciplining. So if you have access to an external DPS receiver, you can configure the disciplining. Obviously, it can be done at different intervals depending on uh, your requirements. Um, you can take telemetry. Uh, the CSAC runs by itself. It, it doesn't need to be programmed. You plug it in and, and it works. Uh, you, you can do some uh, analog tuning. You can do some digital tuning. And uh, you can you can um, request uh, telemetry off the off the system as needed with those with those commands, and there's a bunch of settings and uh, the user guide is actually a great resource. Even if you don't want to do development yet, you, you can download that um, user guide and, and see you know get a preview to all the detailed command structure and telemetry that that the unit offers. And uh, Mohammed. Sahid Ebden, I'm sorry if I messed that up. Um, he, he wants to know if we can use CSAC and LoRaWAN technology um, where they face a lot of clock drift. What was this, uh, so, the, the second part of that question I missed? Um, so he wants to know if we can use it with LoRaWAN technology, uh, so LoRa, um, where they have a lot of clock drift at the moment. So, and how, um, how they could possibly use it there. Well, I think I, that probably warrants a conversation. I'd, I'd love to have a chat on that to figure out how we can help. Certainly, certainly drift is always something that's uh, an issue with, with clocks or, or any oscillators. And uh, if you don't have a, uh, an embedded atomic solution, if you're doing something else today that perhaps is lower performance, uh, we would definitely look to look to see what that is, and then see if we can make an improvement with uh, with the CSAC. And uh, one from Christopher Newell: um, What makes a CSAC different from a five zero seven one A three U system, since they both run on cesium? What a great question! That's a really good question. So. The five, yes. So the fifty seventy one is a microchip product that is used all over the world, and it's cesium um, reference standard used to actually set time. It's a, it's a gas cell about this big inside a big enclosure, it has a lot of sophisticated electronics, and it's meant to be, uh, it's, it's got a high performance um, application, it uses plenty of power, you, you plug it into the wall, and that uses uh, lots of cesium in order to get a very clean, uh, low drift, zero drift atomic clock. The CSAC, uses the same cesium technology, a lot less cesium, very tiny amount. And uh, intrinsically, it'll never be as accurate 
because there's always a trade-off between the size of an atomic clock and the, and the volume of cesium. So we do uh, the similar approach with a tiny amount of cesium, uh, but, but with a different performance level and obviously a m much lower power requirement. Okay, one from Richard Halo. Um, are the modules ITA regulated? They are. They are not. So there, there's. Uh, of course, they're regulated, but they're not export controlled. They're EAR ninety nine uh, in the vernacular. So they're. We export these all over the world to you know, many many places. So they're not uh, restricted by uh, ITAR. And one from Steve Kamenensky. Uh, could this be used to create a cube satellite GPS satellite? Yeah, for sure. So uh, there is a lot of research into having a backup system uh, to the traditional GPS, which is obviously it's it's um, uh, a large satellites billion dollar billion dollar units in space, uh, there is a look uh, and an investigation now to use CubeSats as a backup that have their independent time and uh, can be used to have a backup or to augment the traditional GPS based time signal. So the answer is yes. And um, CSAC and, and a few of the experiments that uh, NASA and others are doing are actually transferring time uh, between CubeSats and the ground in order to evaluate the feasibility of, of that type of solution. And we have one from Devel Sanapara. Uh, which protocol is used to communicate with the CSAC? Um, it's a serial protocol. I don't have it to mind, but it's a very simple command uh, set. And, and the GUI software actually does the work for you if you want to use that. But I think it's an ASCII, but uh, you have to check the user guide on, on that, but it's a very simple protocol. And one last one from Pablo Pesciolotti, or Pesciolotto, sorry. Um, is there any precautions to be taken when manipulating these kinds of devices due to the radiation? Well, the cesium is not radioactive, so there is no uh, problem with uh, radiation. Um, if, if that was a question, typical CubeSat uh, mission length, so it's a, it's a good product for that kind of uh, rating. Nice. Any last questions? That was it. So. So first and foremost, like phenomenal questions. Yeah. Like that, was, that was awesome. That was yeah. really good. Uh, if yeah. we don't get to the one that you are typing furiously right now, just email us at livestream at microchip.com and we will make sure that Stuart gets back to you. And uh, I forgot to mention this. We're going to have links to everything that we talked about in the description and in the comments, so look out for them. And if you don't see them, just email us again at livestream at microchip.com. But uh, thank you, guys. A quick note of programming. Uh, this is the fourth episode of season three, so we have a whole host, host of other episodes, previous episodes, where you guys can watch at microchip.com slash livestream. We have an easy-to-use playlist there, and you can just watch to your heart's content. I'm not going to use the joke that I used the last uh, three times, but that's okay. Um, but anyway, a huge thank you to everybody in front of and behind the camera. It takes a whole team to do this. Uh, thank you to all the viewers, because without you, this wouldn't be happening. And uh, in two weeks, we'll be doing another coffee break where I'll be learning how to uh, spin a motor in three easy ways. So make sure to tune in for that. And otherwise, stay happy, stay healthy, and I will talk to you all later. Bye.